we're grateful to sit down with you and talk about leadership. Um, I would love to hear, as we get started, just tell us how you came to lead the PhD program and really even come to Midwestern to lead a, a whole degree on leadership. Sure, so I, I grew up in a house that esteemed leadership. Uh, we had a small little library in dad's office and uh, there were just John Maxwell books and all, all this leadership stuff. Dad was a young executive uh, and a city councilman and, and so he was a, a young 30-something uh, that probably had more responsibility and less experience than he had um, really capacity for. And so he was constantly hungry to grow and have mentors and those sorts of things. And so I found myself as someone that had a lot of technical knowledge and very little experience, practical experience. And uh, so I sought to, from a very early age, uh, just be equipped in that area. Uh, you guys may remember the, the uh, Promise Keepers uh, generation, and Promise Keepers was a, a thing that was around, you know, for a couple decades. Dad took me to Promise Keepers growing up, and I can remember uh, we were up in the nosebleeds throwing paper airplanes and hoping they, you know, go across the thing. You guys remember that. But I remember him taking me all the way down to the stage, and we could look down the front of the stage and see all these men, like manly men, men with beards. You know, remember I'm eight, and I'm just so impressed. Like, these are guys, and they are fully locked in, engaged in worship. And that just made a profound impact on me. Like, okay, you can be a, a strong man. Some of these guys were like bikers. Uh, and you can love Jesus. Like, that was a profound thing. But one of the things I quickly realized is off of that emotional high, a lot of us went home and just kind of went back to our normal lives and didn't lead, didn't engage in the, the ministry and the mission of the church. And so I've just always had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder of like, man, I, I want to equip everyone to be released into ministry, to leverage their gifts, to, to see themselves as leaders. And so that set me off into doing a PhD. Uh, that was really the heart behind it is, is not necessarily wanting to nerd out on some finer theological point, but I really wanted the key. I wanted, I wanted to get a degree that would give me a key to unlock doors to honestly be able to do stuff like this. And I got to teach yesterday. And so the PhD was really a means to the end of someone handing me a mic so I could, I could say to the guys on the front row, like, keep, keep leading and go home and engage your communities and serve and lead your families. And there's a lot of confusion, I think, in this generation of what leadership is, and even those that know what it is, uh, whether or not they have the courage to, to live that out. And so that's kind of the burden. So let's, let's talk a little bit, let's dive into some definitions and some terms. So leadership, the word itself in scripture, handful of times. Sure. But you've got a whole degree devoted to leadership. That's right. So, so walk us through even what that what you mean when you talk about leadership. Yeah, so I define leadership as taking initiative for the glory of God and the good of others. Taking initiative for the glory of God and the good of others. So the act of initiative is a step towards something. And so I would say when you look at the mission of God, what is God up to in the world? We see that God's own mission, he's moving towards us. He's revealing himself to us. He's, he's extending grace to those in need. Uh, he calls us image bearers. We see that initially in Genesis 1, but throughout scripture we're called to to be like God and, and, and more specifically be like Jesus. And so when I think about leadership, it's, it's following Jesus. And we're following in the footsteps of Jesus in a thousand iterations, whether we're moms or dads or even junior high students that call Jesus their savior. They're called to take initiative for the glory of God and the good of others. When you think about scripture, you're right. If you were to do a word study in scripture, there's not a ton. I mean, there's, there, there may be 20, but it's, yeah. it's not a ton. Um, what I would say, there's a hermeneutical principle that, that would argue that there are things that are assumed in Scripture because they're so important. There are a lot of concepts like family adoption that in Scripture are just so um, central to their framework and their worldview that it would just be assumed. And so I would argue the concept of, of being on mission with God, being like God, being an image bearer and being about the Lord's work is so central to scripture that it's not constantly talked about in that way. It's just assumed that if you're one of God's people, you're going to be about the Lord's business. And so that's very different than a secular view of leadership. And, and we see uh, leadership in a secular view as more boardrooms and management and productivity hacks and all those sorts of things. And all that's really important. And I love that stuff. I, I will nerd out on that 
and talk about it as much as you want to, but I think often us in the leadership context, we've missed that foundational mission side of things. And so if you're not charismatic, uh, frankly, if you're in a complementarian environment, if you're not a man, if you're not an elder, uh, you don't have a bunch of Twitter followers, you just say, I'm not a leader. And I think when we look to scripture, we say, well, regardless of what you call this, leadership or mission, you're called to be about the Lord's business. You're called to be on mission with God, uh, taking initiative for his glory and the good of others, Matthew 22. So, so that's the burden. Um, the, the big thing is we're moving. When we see scripture, there's mission and movement throughout scripture. And then why do we do that? What are the guardrails? We joked in our class about uh, playing uh, bowling. You know, if you're really bad at bowling, you need the guardrails. It's helpful to think m movement for movement's sake is not helpful. Uh, it may even be carnal just to go out and do stuff. But when we think about what is missional leadership, well, it's movement within the boundaries of and towards the direction of God's glory and the good of others. Yeah, let's flesh that out a little bit. So leadership in the church, yeah. what does that begin to look like? Because I think we frame leadership as the decision maker, yeah. right? That, that tends to be the default. Sure. We, we, whoever's making that call, they're the, they're the leader. Um, but what does leadership look like in a, in a pastoral context? That's great. So we, we would define leadership, again, as taking initiative for the glory of God, the good of others. We would say that's both the, the basis and bedrock, is a phrase I would use, of all forms of leadership. And so while all are called to do that, some also are elders, some also are husbands, and Ephesians 5 called to love and lead their wives. That's one of the ways Scripture talks about leadership. And then finally, uh, we have some that have the spiritual gift of leadership. And so when you walk into any congregation, there's a mixture of all four of those categories. But everyone in the room is called to lead. They're, everyone in the room is called to take initiative for the glory of God and the good of others. But that is... Um, that submits to the context. So if you're an elder at a church and I'm not, and I walk into that context, my identity as a missional leader, I don't put a mute on that, but your identity as our elder sits above that, right? Does, it, does that make sense? And so um, that's how I would think about that economy. Uh, another thing I would say when we think about um, leadership as a spiritual gift, is we think about that as evangelism. A lot of people get confused. Um, if I'm saying everybody's called to lead and yet some have a gift, that can be confusing. But we would say that's analogous to uh, everybody's called to evangelize. Some have the gift of evangelism. I would say everybody's called to take initiative for the glory of God and the good of others. Some are especially gifted by God in that space for the good of the church. I, I'm curious, and I'll just deviate a little bit, but you started talking about the, the spiritual gift of leadership. How does that manifest a little differently than um, everyone's called to lead? Okay, I love that because that's, that's a reality. Um, obviously, some are appointed to lead, but what is this idea that, like, what does that even manifest as that someone is gifted to lead? Sure. Well, when you think about how a gift manifests, I think it manifests in a local congregation, in community, under the authority of elders or leaders who are identifying gifts in that body. And so I think, I think you see this dysfunctionally a lot. We used to do gift tests and things like this, and it almost becomes a right and an entitlement. I have this gift, and therefore, it's not what we see in the New Testament. We see this um, bubbling up of goodness and gifts from the church, which people identify, maybe small groups and friends and elders, go, man, you seem to be really gifted at that. When you look at the Greek of the use of the word lead in like Romans 12, 8, for example, that, that means it's actually more about management and administration. So if somebody at your church finds themselves uh, loving a good Excel spreadsheet, they love, uh, I joked in class yesterday, they go to the potluck and they're immediately wondering why there aren't people serving on both sides of the table and this could be so more efficient and those sorts of things. That's actually annoying in some ways. It's also for the good of the church and it's, it's a gift, properly channeled, it's a gift to the church. And so that's something, I think even what I'm trying to do, even in the class yesterday, there's parts where, where I'm sure people in the class are going, man, he is so nerding out on these categories. But until we properly um, delineate between these four categories, you just see leadership as this distant, amorphous thing that kind of lands on people occasionally, and this person's gifted and this person's not. 
Think about women. I, I have three uh, daughters. I have three sisters. Uh, if you think about leadership the way the church typically thinks about it, this is really a lack of clarity than it is a speaking against something. But typically the way we talk about leadership, it always sounds like we're talking about men and elders. So if you stand up in your church and say, we need to develop leaders in the church, most women are checking out. They may not even consciously check out. They're just thinking you're thinking about men or people. Maybe it's a man that's introverted uh, or a new convert or things like that. And so you just want to constantly remind people that, no, this is the call of everyone in the church. Yes, some people are uniquely gifted. I mean, look at, look at someone like James Dobson or Jason Allen. We would clearly look at their lives and go, this just comes, in, like, Dr. Allen's working really, really hard, but he also wakes up and he's just three steps ahead of us. He's just a, a great leader that the Lord's using. I think it's because he has a gift, and yet that doesn't excuse the rest of us uh, from fulfilling God's call in our life to, to lead, to take initiative. We don't have to opt out of That's right. that responsibility because somebody else is that's really right. gifted in it. That's right. That's exactly right. All right. Well, so pastors yep. are qualified to lead a church by how they lead their home. What does it look like to lead well in the home? I Man, I think that's something that we miss a lot. I, I can tell you the things that come to my mind a lot. When, when I think about my life, uh, how I order my time is such a big question, where I give my energy. But the things that I, I'm pretty consistently thinking about, I'm not a robot, I don't have some big plan, but the things I'm consistently asking myself for is, am I being, bringing the same level of intentionality um, intensity, creativity, joy to home that I bring to work. And I think for a lot of men and women, uh, you can go to work, uh, you give your best there because you have to, somebody's waiting on it, and you come home and you're just depleted. And it's easy to scroll Facebook and just zone out and not really engage your family. And so that's, that's something I'm asking a lot. Uh, and then we see that in scripture when you think about qualified elders, the family and the wife is a huge deal. Their reputation amongst those in their communities is a big deal. And I think what they're pointing to is, is there symmetry between what's happening at home and what's happening at church and what's happening internally and externally. And I think a lot of that comes down to um, just the intentionality of, of where you're giving your life, where you're giving your energy. I should tell you, I, I don't do that uh, remotely perfectly, but it's it's something I'm, I'm striving towards. And it's probably the most constant thing back here. The only other thing I'd say that has been such a blessing to us is we have done, on average, every year or two, we do a family, we call it a family playbook. And we just define like, hey, what's the vision of our family? What's God called us to do? What are th goals for the year? Um, and it sounds like if somebody told me that five years ago, I'd roll my eyes like, oh my gosh, you're, you're so annoying. But it's been really, it, we tape it on the inside of a, a cabinet in the kitchen. It's just every time you get Tylenol, you see, hey, this is what God's called us to do. And I, I literally saw it yesterday. And it said one hour of TV. And we're totally blowing it. Uh, we're doing more than one hour of TV. But even that, just having that there, it's just, it's a helpful kind of guardrail for us. So that's a big deal. Well, and you're saying, what I hear you saying is intentionality for the glory of God and the good of others in the home first. Yes. And that allows me to do that well in the church. Sure. Yeah. yeah that's that's right. good. All right. Well, here, here's a practical question for pastors who um, are just, th they've got a lot on their plate. How do you lead well without getting burned out because the, the church yeah. as a whole right especially smaller churches 85 percent of churches are under a couple hundred people sure you're wearing a lot of hats sure. how do you lead well on the missions team and and the the sunday night prayer ministry and all these spaces how do you lead well with intentionality sure without burning out yeah let me uh as much as i can divide it between personal and professional so the thing that immediately comes to mind is where you're rooting and finding your identity. And I think a lot of people are burning out because they see themselves as their job. They see themselves as their gift. They have a gift of preaching. And when someone questions that, their whole, they're really uh, unstable or unstable, right? Because they're just constantly having uh, people question what is their very core. So we see in scripture constantly reminding us that we're sons and daughters and we're in Christ and we're rooted in Christ and uh, our security is at the right hand of the Father, all these sorts of things. And I don't think the Holy Spirit was forgetful and just redundant. I think it's a reminder of how desperately we need to hear that. And so I would want to find out if a pastor was, was telling me, man, I'm on the verge of burnout. I would immediately, I think, think in two veins. And the first is, man, 
how are you in Christ doing? And how's your walk with the Lord? And where do you see yourself? How are you measuring yourself? Men do a really bad job of measuring themselves uh, as it relates to success and performance. Women tend to be more maybe relational and home and um, as much as you can try to make those as categories, I think those can be helpful. Professionally, I would ask, uh, man, are you delegating well? Are you bringing people along? Is there a vision that people can see themselves within and be empowered and move with you? And I think a lot of people, maybe they don't have the gift of leadership or they just are inexperienced or you jump into a frying pan of urgency in some organization and to pull the car over and stop and say, what are our vision? What's our vision? What's our values? And what's the strategy? And let's change it feels really counterproductive and it feels like a luxury that, that you just don't have. Like we've got to do the next thing. And I, I think, um, I think the, the older, more mature leader goes, no, we actually have to slow down here to go faster later to bring more people along. And, and leadership, the higher you go in leadership, the more you're working through other people's hands. I think it's a really good illustration. So if you're a pastor and you, you have one staff member and it's you, your literal hands are on everything. You're sweeping floors, you're counting money, you're doing whatever. At a bigger church, uh, more and more you're leading through paper and vision and strategies and calendars and things like that. And so that just, back to the personal side, it means that that identity has got to be pretty solid because you're increasingly trusting more and more people that you may not even know their name but they're running your child care. So that puts more and more pressure on vision, more and more pressure on values, more and more pressure on culture, but more and more pressure on you to go, hey, my identity is not whether or not that person's an awesome leader. You hope they are, hope they do a great job, um, but you're more than that. The Lord's called you to more than that. He's assured you of more than that, and you rest in that, and I think that frees you to do uh, pretty wide things organizationally. Tell us a time when you blew it in leadership. Maybe, maybe you just, you thought you had a, a, the right way, maybe you lost identity, you're focused on what your true identity as a son of God is, but just tell us a time when you blew it as a leader. Man, there's so many things I could say. I think one of the things that has been most helpful, a failure that has had the biggest yield in my life. Uh, I was at Southern Seminary uh, in 2012, Southern Seminary was like a bastion of theological education. It was Camelot. Like, it was just so much fun. We we're having a great time. And um, when Dr. Allen called us to come over here, like, a, a lot of people there were really eager on us staying there. And we were kind of the, like, we're going to buck the system and we're going to go do the, we're, le we're going to leave the Yankees and go to the Oakland A's. And um, it was really, really scary. And I think there was excitement initially, and, but it also was really, really scary. I mean, I, I was telling uh, Matt Boswell out here, I, I literally teared up. I'm not a crier, but like after the first chapel at Midwestern Seminary, because I just left a thousand people, amazing singing, all this. And I just thought, oh my gosh, you know, I've just moved my family here and what have we done? And, and uh, I think looking back, that produced a lot of anxiety in me. Uh, I'm wired where I don't feel anxiety. I've learned to know that I'm anxious, but I don't feel it like I think a lot of people would think. I just get busy. Uh, I may get angry, I may get short, I may, get, I may withdraw, I may do all these things. But I had men uh, on our leadership team. I took them on a retreat, and this retreat was so awesome. We went and played paintball. I took them to a Royals game, all this in one day. It was so amazing. And the night finished at a nice steakhouse. And I did the perfunctory leader thing, like, hey, I'd love to hear how I can be a better leader. And honestly, Josh, it was... They're going to tell me, you're great. You're so great. We're loving this. Paintball was so much fun. And I remember one of the people at the table put their fork down, like in this really like dramatic, like, oh, I'm about to get punched. And to a man, they went around the room and said, man, I, I think there are ways that fear is driving your leadership uh, that we feel. And it feels less about what God's called us to and this amazing opportunity than, hey, let's not mess up. Let's, let's get after this, those sorts of things. And, man, that was one of the greatest gifts of my life. It, it hurt my feelings so much. I remember I couldn't even talk. Like, I couldn't respond. And, and one of the reasons that was so helpful to me is it showed me, like, they put their finger on an idol that was so powerful that I couldn't even open my mouth or I would cry. And so I, I had kind of two choices in the coming weeks. And one was to kind of take my ball and go home and withdraw and say, you guys lead. This is really hard. And, and 
honestly, that's what I wanted to do most of the time. And by God's grace, uh, they were really gracious to me and, can, and, and didn't withdraw themselves from me and said, man, we want to we wanna see you through this and we love you and you don't have to do that. We're with you. And so today, I think uh, my leadership is, is a lot different because men and women around me, um, even when I wasn't inviting them, spoke into my life and said, hey, we're seeing some things that aren't awesome um, that maybe a lot of people wouldn't even notice. It's not like a moral failure or something like that, but they had the courage enough to say, hey, we think you're, you're, you're better than this and, and you're being driven by some things that are unhelpful. So that always comes to mind to me is like, man, that what a gift to have people that love you enough to risk. That was probably a really awkward way to end a retreat, uh, but they did that because they loved the school and they loved me. How do you create that culture of... I mean that that's that's really kind of spectacular that 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 individual sat that fork down and spoke honestly in front of a group, not even one on one. You invited it, but but how do you build that as a culture of um, in your leadership where you have people given them the freedom to speak to you about ways you can improve? Yeah, I think you've got to ask it. Uh, you've got to invite it. And you need to have friends that are a combination of proximate. They're close to you. So the men at that table were proximate. They hung out with me a lot. They saw all the cracks. Uh, they were also given permission. Uh, so they were invite, even though I was kind of fake inviting them to speak into my life, they were given permission that night. And so I think leaders have to uh, continually recognize if you're a good Christian guy or girl, you're trained your whole life to like suck it up, suffer, do hard things. I can remember listening to James Dobson talk about not making excuses. I can remember where I was listening, listening to him say that. And so because of that, that means when I'm having a hard time with my boss, it's kind of like, hey, soldier on. And so unless your leader is saying, hey, I, I want to hear about that. And, and, and people know when you are just feigning uh, humility. So you really want to hear and I think that's something you just have to continually, like the way organizations want to drift is towards silos, isolation, and um, the breakdown of relationships and trust. And so the leader, it, it's a heavy responsibility, but just to continually remind people of, hey, I'm, I'm not above that. I need that, that's good for me. And so when somebody punches you on the chin, uh, we talked in our class yesterday about thinking about how you're gonna respond in advance. Because when you get punched, Mike Tyson says, I think you always have a plan to get punched in the face. That's true of criticism. And so how can you even model, think about that dinner, there's seven people there, one of them said that, they're all looking at you, right? And if you look like you're gonna punch back, that's the last time anybody will put their fork down. Like that's it. And so you have to, um, by God's grace, develop a muscle for genuinely seeing feedback as a, a means of grace. Mm -hmm.